pray for blessings. We pray for peace. Comfort for family. Protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while you hear each spoken need, Yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? <clears throat> we pray for wisdom, your voice to hear, and we cry in anger when cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while you hear each desperate plea. And long that we'd have faith to believe. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not our home. What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? And what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if my greatest disappointment or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can satisfy? And what if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the darkest nights, are your mercies in disguise? Thank you, Holly John. We appreciate that. Oh, how God works through the trials and tribulations and troubles of life, so much so that uh, each of the New Testament writers, each in their own way, testify that such trying of our faith is more precious than silver 
end goal. We have a great God. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the opportunity we have now to open up the pages of your book. Thank you for the way in which our music and all of the component parts of your service this morning lends itself well to your message to us. Be our guide. May the Holy Spirit of God do his all-important work. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We are at the front end of the Apostle Paul's epistle to young Pastor Titus. We are currently working our way through the introduction of the book, which we find in the first four verses of the chapter. I am noting with you again this morning that we have an amazing introduction before us. If this is all that we had, you and I would have an awful lot. Uh, you may have noticed that in our English translations, verses 1 through 4 form a single sentence. Even that is instructive to us, communicating to us that everything that we have here needs to be held together. Everything that we have in verses 1 through 4 ought to be seen together. I note that with you because we come this morning to verse 2. But again, it's obvious that verse 2 must be viewed within the light of verse 1. Although we have a verse division here, uh, and we know that uh, that is not a part of inspiration, as it were, although we have a verse division here, we really ought not to separate verses 1 and 2. The first phrase of verse 2 is most significant, most strategic, and again, it sends us back to verse 1. Here's what Paul says at the beginning of verse 2. In hope of eternal life. In hope of eternal life. Before we look at the phrase semantically, I want you to see it with me contextually, and I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say to you. Everything that we saw in verse 1 is inseparably linked to the first phrase that we have here in verse 2. Simply put, you can't talk about Paul without citing his personal hope of eternal life. You show me a servant of God. You show me an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. You show me someone who is dominated by the scriptures. You show me someone who is faithfully acknowledging the truth of God's word. You show me someone who is godly. And I will show you someone who both possesses and practices the hope of eternal life. The very first word in the phrase actually substantiates the observation we just made. It's a preposition. The King James Version uh, translators chose to translate the preposition as in, in the hope of eternal life. I, I like that for this reason. It draws a clear line of distinction you are either in or you are out. If you could draw like and envision a big circle and that big circle representing the hope of eternal life, this is true of each and every one of us who are here this morning. We are either in or we are out. It's interesting to me, I know practically, and in regard to earthly sojourn, that there's a lot of fence riding that you and I can and probably do. But I don't know that God has any fences like that for you and I to ride. And certainly in regard to this all-important topic, and we really don't even fully know what it means yet, in regard to this all-important topic of the hope of eternal life, we are either in or we are out. 
if being out, if you're recognizing this morning that being out is a little bit disconcerting to you, then good news. You're here. You're alive and well. Your heart is beating. The Holy Spirit of God is working. And you can be saved today. More about that in just a moment. But the Greek word that we have here, this very first word, a preposition both in the English and the Greek, the Greek word that we have here is epi, which is usually translated by the translators as upon. I like this too. For it clearly substantiates our observation that everything that we have in verse 1 is inseparably linked to this first phrase in verse 2. The preposition makes the hope of eternal life foundational. I say it again. The preposition makes the hope of eternal life foundational. Certainly foundational to everything that we have already seen in verse 1, and frankly foundational to every and any other thing that we would see in the inscripturated Word of God. It's that important. So the preposition, and this is interesting because we have not discussed yet, although you guys are good, and you probably have a pretty decent understanding of what the hope of eternal life means and is, but what's interesting to me is that God challenges us right from the get-go with the very first word, a simple preposition. And, and, and the challenge goes like this, it's twofold. One, and, and we've already hinted at this, one, do you have it? Are you in? Do, do you have the hope of eternal life? Is that your confidence this morning? Do you have it? And two, and this is challenging for us this morning, and although by the way of principle we probably have seen it from other texts and from different angles, the fact of the matter is we, we, we have the distinct possibility and potential of reading right over the tremendous and deep and divine challenge that's inherent in this first phrase. Because the question for us this morning is twofold. It's not only do you have it, and by the way, that's salvation. That's the difference between being saved and not saved. The difference between heaven and hell. The difference between being a Christian and not being a Christian. The difference between being redeemed and not redeemed. The first question is all important and uh, certainly foundational. It revolves around the all-important topic of salvation, do you have it? Do you have the hope of eternal life? But that's not the only question. And the second question is, are you passionately? Listen to Paul speaking on behalf of God. Listen to Titus' heartbeat in response to Paul's writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Are you and I actively, passionately building on it? One, do you have it? Do you have the hope of eternal life? And two, are you and I building actively, passionately on it a life of ministry, a life of service, a life of obedience? Now, the word hope what an awesome word. Listen, folks, I'm not talking about the world's definition. I'm telling you that in regard to hope, as God defines it, it better be on your list of top ten biblical words. We sure wouldn't have the worldling's definition of hope on our top ten words, but God's. We would and we should it is absolutely unique there's no pride in any of this it reflects so clearly and exclusively on the gracious and merciful work of the lord jesus christ in y'all's life 
But this idea of hope is absolutely unique to you. The worldling knows nothing of biblical hope. Paul, writing to the Christians in Ephesus in chapter 2 and verse 12 of his epistle, he reminds us of the time when we were, quote, without Christ. And then he goes on to give the further description, having no hope. You see, and by the way, we won't be emphasizing this too much, but catch it in passing that there's an inseparable link between the personage of the Lord Jesus Christ and our hope of eternal life. In fact, hope is one of Christ's titles. So it makes an awful lot of sense that Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God to the church in Ephesus, actually the churches in Ephesus would remind them of the time when they were without Christ and thus they had no hope. Hope, and you all remember how that um, how Paul introduces that classic text of Scripture dealing with the rapture of the church when he says, "I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep, that you sorrow not as those as others who have no hope." I, I'm telling you, this hope thing is a big, big deal. And again, I'm restating by way of emphasis that it's absolutely exclusively applied to God, the work of God in the lives of the children of God. Absolutely unique to the Christian. That's why when the worldling uses the word, he's using a word different than God's word. The Greek word, and if you've been around, you should be somewhat familiar with it. Again, it's working its way up on our top ten list of biblical words. For me, you wouldn't be wrong because it's inseparably linked to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You wouldn't be wrong if this was your number one word. Would you make a commitment to me over the next uh, 17 minutes that if the Holy Spirit of God stirs your heart and if you see something that just is a little bit exciting in regard to the gracious and merciful work of God that you would express something on your face? (laughs) I do not want to go this alone. It's a Greek word, alpis, noun, alpizo verb. It means, you may recall, certain expectation. It gets no better than that, by the way, and it's not my definition. It's God's. But lest you think, boy, I I, I may have trouble getting a hold on uh, this most significant and even awesome term, perhaps it's so deep in theology that I am going to have trouble understanding it in its fullness and don't misunderstand. It's a most wonderful word and we will indeed spend all of eternity coming to grips with the fullness of its truth. But please with me understand it in its blessed simplicity, certain expectation. In contrast to the worldling's wishful thinking, How many times have you talked to an individual who clearly does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, who happens to have arrived at a place in their lives where they're contemplating even the end of life, like the death of a spouse or a child or a relative, and you have the opportunity to ask them about their eternal uh, destination, and they say something like, well, I can only hope. But when God uses the term, he's not speaking about wishful thinking. And I'm glad that God offers something more to God's people than wishful thinking. But oh, if that's the case, 
I mean, if this word is more than wishful thinking, then oh, how we absolutely ought to be governed by hope. The word, of course, is inseparably linked to the promises of God. Thus, we sang standing on the promises of God. Paul, of course, cites this inseparable link here clearly and again succinctly in our, in our verse. The, the, the word, revel in this with me, the, the word pertains to future things. How could that be? How could there be anything in the future that is so certain that God anticipates not only that you and I are going to faithfully and consistently rejoice in that, but beyond that, that it would be so certain and so divinely rock solid that he would actually anticipate that you and I would be building our lives on future things. That obviously, because they pertain to the future, have not happened yet. But, because God, who can not lie. Wednesday nighters, God who not only doesn't lie, but God who can not lie. Has promised. That God, he says to God's people, you, you go to the bank. On this thing. Let hope be foundational. Build upon the hope of eternal life. Certain expectation that what God has said will happen, will happen. So certain. That although in space and time it has not yet occurred. You not only embrace the truth, but you allow it to order your life now. That's what God's after. God is actually anticipating that we're going to believe him. And that our belief is going to be so strong, so deep, so wide. That we build on things that haven't even happened yet. certain expectation that God will do what he has said he will do. And all of God's people said, with a big, big smile on your face, glory, hallelujah, three, praise the Lord's. <laughs> One, two, three. Th thank you all very much. Now the phrase, now the, the word, the phrase, eternal life. In the hope of eternal life. This too, by the way, I shouldn't, I, I know I don't have to say this to you, but it's warranted. This too is absolutely unique to the one who has turned from his sin and embraced the one and only Savior. Absolutely unique to the true Christian. Absolutely unique to the sons and daughters having been made such. Absolutely unique to the sons and daughters of God. In fact, listen very carefully to this. An amazingly stark contrast between the eternal life of the Christ receiver and the eternal death of the Christ rejecter. Remember the simplicity of either being in or out? Listen again. A stark contrast between the eternal life of the Christ receiver and eternal death of the Christ rejecter. Oh, how we 
so desperately need the Lord Jesus Christ. We are lost in our sin, condemned and separated from God, practically in this life, completely and totally, and eternally in the life to come, save for Jesus Christ. Oh, if you haven't trusted him, listen. If you're not in, please. There's only one divine solution to the problem of your and my sin. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the one who loved us so much that he was willing to take our place on Calvary's cross. It's the one who actually bore the penalty of our sins so that he, through his death, burial, and resurrection, could pave the way for the forgiveness of our sins and, yea, indeed, the gift of eternal life. Oh, folks, if you haven't trusted Christ yet as your own personal Savior, it's time. Trust him today. Become like a little child and pray and invite Christ into your heart and life as your own personal Savior from sin. Eternal life in the hope of eternal life. I'd, I'd like you in your mind's eye to take a little biblical journey with me in regard to eternal life. You ready? One, when you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are given the gift of eternal life. You, you, you have it the very moment that you trust Jesus. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. Here's the good. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John 5 is so very significant. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life. He that doesn't have the Son doesn't have life. Maxwell understands You got Jesus? Have you received him? Have you taken him as your own? Do you have a personal relationship with God through his son, the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? Here's stop number one. When you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are given right then the gift of eternal life. You've got it. Stop number two. Like if we're driving. Sorry, I just may be mixing my metaphors or going on to analogies and not inviting you to come with me. Stop. Number two, I love this. Christ in John chapter 17 and verse 3 defines eternal life simply as, and I'm quoting, knowing God. Can you believe it? The idea of having a personal relationship with God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The idea of walking with the Lord, communing with the Lord, having fellowship with the Lord by faith now and someday face to face. All of a sudden, we've gone from reveling in our salvation that we have in rich and free in Christ to recognizing that there's a better day coming. There's a better day coming Glory, hallelujah, there's a better day coming for God's people. Christ defines eternal life as having a personal relationship with God, of walking with God by faith now, and then seeing the Son of God, who is the fullness of the Godhead, face to face. Someday soon. Stop number three. Although we have been given the gift of eternal life, there are a number of future aspects to 
that gift that won't come to full fruition until some time later. For instance, we have the gift of life, but we have not yet entered our eternal home. We have the gift of eternal life, but we have not yet seen with the physical eye our Savior. I love 1 Peter. I love 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. Whom having not seen, we absolutely, positively, deeply, unconditionally love. Whom having not seen we love, whom having not seen we believe, whom having not seen we rejoice with joy unspeakable. That's why I know that there's a lot more in your heart than what you're showing on your face this morning. Joy unspeakable. All concerning someone whom we haven't even seen with the physical eye. And yet when you talk about the realness of things in life, frankly, and I, I wouldn't even begin to ex be able to express to you how, how deeply I love my wife, how fully I love my family, and even my church family, but the fact of the matter is it does not hold a candle to the love of someone that I haven't even seen yet. We have eternal life, but we're still strapped with this earthly sojourn of ours with all of its trials and troubles and tribulations and even sadness and sickness and death. But not much longer. We have eternal life, but we have not yet received our eternal reward. So if you and I, carrying our basket, would pick up each of these blessed treasures and put them in our basket and hold the basket and listen to God say, hey, in regard to these blessed future things that are in your basket that have not happened yet but will soon because God who cannot lie has promised, then build your life on the things in the basket. The question is, are we? Paul is pleading with us on behalf of God to live our lives in light of the big picture. You and I ought to actually be doing things now that are absolutely linked to future things that God has promised. And are you the fool? Well, Not if you're embracing God's promises, because God not only cannot, God not only does not, he can not lie. See, do you see it? I, I'm, I'm leaving here today, this is the way it ought to be. My, my life motivated, moved founded on things that have not happened yet but will because God who cannot lie has promised. So two things, we're back to the beginning. Make sure you're in and then child of God, make sure that you're building upon the foundation of the hope of eternal life. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, I be including our service in just a second. And child of God, you have your commission. <laughs> and I'm certainly not going to belabor anything else, but you're here this morning or perhaps in the sound of this voice and you, you're not in. You don't know Christ. There hasn't been a time when you recognize your need of Christ because of your sin. Hasn't been a time when you prayed 
and invited Christ into your heart and life as your own personal Savior. We're, we're giving you a quiet moment to do that even now. W would you talk to God? He's so anxious to save us, to deliver us from our sin. His ear is always open to the heart cry of anyone who recognizes their need and embraces God's one and only solution. Would you say yes to Jesus in the quietness of this moment? Would you pray? Receiving him as your own personal Savior so that you can join us in embracing the second challenge, and that is that we, together, as God's people, those who have been made righteous through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, saved, saved, saved through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, so you can join us as we together build better and more fully on the hope of eternal life, governed by future things that have not happened yet, but they will because God who cannot lie has promised Heavenly Father, we thank you. What a tremendous challenge. It's a simple phrase. We almost read right over it. In here, it contains really all of life. Both salvation, where we are once for all delivered from the penalty and condemnation of our sin by having trusted Christ, to sanctification of becoming more and more like Christ, of becoming better servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, of doing a better job and being obedient to the commands and calls and commissions of Christ, of being better at acknowledging the truth, of allowing the, the faith, the, the inscripturated word of God to govern our lives. Help us. To that end, we pray for Jesus' sake, amen. Please take your hymnals once again and turn to 125. It speaks of a book in Revelation 20, 12, God's Book of Life. And in singing this song, 125, in the red book. Are you in? Are you in those pages? Will you be written there? Or will your name be outside of those pages? Let's stand. 125, is my name written there? Lord, I care not for riches, neither silver nor gold. I would make sure of heaven. I would enter the fold. Through the book of thy kingdom, with his pages so fair, tell me, my Savior, is my name written there? Is my name written there on the page white? 